I'll just quickly introduce Dr. Terry McCosker from Rural Consulting Services. He's one of the great innovators of Australian agriculture and he's led an inordinate impact on agricultural practices over many time, many years. Terry was conferred an honorary doctorate in agribusiness in March 2015 and awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia in 2021 for his contribution to agriculture. So can you please welcome Terry to the, the screen? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, are we on? Yes, we are. We are. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you, Minister, for hosting today and thank you for the invitation uh, to attend and uh, follow to all the carbon farmers there. I uh, would like to just start off by uh, and many of you probably know the difference between sequestration and avoided emissions. So if we, are, we were to lower fuel and power usage, et cetera, we're, we're avoiding emissions and uh, coming down the track, there'll be some carbon credits available for that. But what's happening in the market at the moment is that it's really starting to differentiate between an avoided emission and sequestration. Uh, and sequestration is putting it away in, in vegetation and in soils. But I think the thing that uh, is probably certainly not well known, I think, in, in general society is that we are, in fact, working within a carbon cycle. And I think because of the sort of headlines uh, around power stations and so on that you see on television, I think there's a view that carbon is actually linear. But certainly in agriculture, we work within the carbon cycle. And uh, it, it's really important for many, many reasons that, uh, that we understand that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about soil organic carbon, but firstly, I want to differentiate between organic matter and organic carbon. So living organisms, fresh residue and decomposing stuff, etc., all of that makes up uh, organic matter, but organic carbon in round figures is about half of organic matter. So when I talk about carbon for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be talking about organic carbon. This is a, a soil carbon project on uh, five and a half thousand hectares. I will show you some results on this a little bit further down in the talk. But uh, all the different colours there are strata and or um, CEAs, carbon estimation areas. And the numbers on the screen are tonnes of carbon per hectare measured down to a metre. And you'll see some significant variability across that landscape from around 40 tonnes of carbon per hectare to a high of 155 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Um, now, that is a grazing property, uh, but we will come back to that. From a farming perspective, the thing that actually makes this work is that, that what you put into the soil is organic carbon. The change that's measured over time is in organic carbon. But what the market is wanting is carbon dioxide. And essentially for every tonne of carbon, organic carbon that you put away into a soil, you're sequestering 3.7 tonnes of carbon dioxide. And it's carbon dioxide that you get paid for. And it's this multiplier that actually makes it work because the rate of sequestration of soil carbon is very, very slow. And if we were to be paid on the basis of the carbon itself, um, then it, it probably uh, wouldn't be worth it in terms of uh, carbon projects. And this is the only multiplier that I'm aware of in agriculture that actually works in your favour. So a tonne of CO2 equals one ACU, Australian Carbon Credit Unit. And once you've got a carbon credit unit, or many of them, they go into uh, an, what's called an ANREU account, which is a special account where every carbon credit has an electronic signature, which says whether it's a soil carbon or whether it's a forestry project or some other form of abatement, uh, where it came from, uh, and all the details around that, uh, that credit. When you have credits, you have the ability to either trade them or hold them, and you certainly don't need to sell them uh, immediately. But there is also a trend in the market at the moment um, to devalue uh, what's called vintage carbon. So if you hold on to it for too long, 
it will actually start to devalue uh, as it, its vintage ages, if you like. So I would expect that something that's more than 10 to 15 years old and certainly uh, 20 years old, those credits are certainly being discounted now by the market. So in terms of returns uh, from doing a soil carbon project on a property, there's a number of drivers. And the first and the biggest one is the sequestration rate. That is the rate in tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum that you can add to your soil. Uh, and obviously the price of carbon is also a driver. Uh, I was doing yesterday some discovery on the value of soil carbon credits. And uh, over the next few months, we have over 400,000 tonnes of soil carbon credits going to the market. And I was told that the price of those credits is likely to be uh, in today's market, somewhere between $60 and $150 a tonne. Now, the reasons for it being so high are firstly, that it is sequestration rather than an avoided mission. Secondly, it's involving regenerative agriculture, which is something that the market really enjoys. And I'll show you some numbers shortly to show why the market is also excited about these credits. So the price will affect the property of uh, the cost of measurement um, is actually a two-edged sword. You can go out and do measurements quite cheaply and you run the risk of the variability in the sampling wiping out any potential gains that you're likely to make. Uh, the way I look at it is that there's, there's actually a myth around the cost of me measurement. The cost of measurement is not really a cost where the, the cost comes in is inaccuracy. And if you've got a, a measurement system with high uncertainty, the, it has a major discount on all the carbon credits you're likely to receive over a 25 year period. So spending the money up front and getting particularly that baseline accurately done uh, is quite important. And scale of project also is important. So once you start to get below about uh, 1,000 hectares, these projects start to become a little more dicey. But as the price of carbon lifts and as we get more confident in sequestration rates, then I think we can come right back to small-scale projects. Um, and certainly with um, potential price of soil carbon credits being up in the $100 a tonne sort of range, then that um, starts to bring the scale way back down into the three, four, five hundred hectare project um, scales, providing your sequestration rate is reasonable. So I thought I'd throw in a couple of uh, bits of data from WA on sequestration rates. Uh, and this first one is from uh, subtropical perennial grasses. Uh, Again, uh, sort of a bit north of Mora, I think this uh, data was collected, only 0 to 30 centimetres uh, and only over six years. But the sequestration rates in tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum are 1.3 to 2.6. And that greatly exceeds what I would have expected on those sort of soil types. Um, and I will address the question that uh, somebody had just asked before the photographs were taken, and that is about depth. Uh, of the 400 odd thousand tonnes of CO2 that we'll be going to market with shortly, uh, over 50% of those credits will be issued from below 30 centimetres. And if we've got time later, I can talk about the effect of drought on that. Um, a long term study on Tagasasti, uh, measured to 90 centimetres, uh, has showed 0.9 of a tonne of carbon sequestered per hectare per annum. Uh, and that was measured between the rows in annual pasture. So I would expect that if you actually put some uh, subtropical pastures in between those rows and managed it um, in, a, in a very sustainable way, then that sequestration rate would increase uh, even more than that. Why is soil carbon uh, important? I think whether you do a soil carbon project or not, soil carbon is actually critical to the future of farming. Firstly, by adding uh, organic carbon to our soils, we're going to increase yields and increase carrying capacity. We're also going to get free nitrogen in a ratio of about 1 to 12. So for every um, kilogram, uh, so for every, I'll go put it in tonnes, which probably makes more sense. So for every tonne of carbon that we add to a soil, 
per hectare, we're going to be adding 80 kilos of nitrogen to that soil. Uh, and eventually, and there's a lot of evidence around that as you increase your soil organic carbon, there's no need to uh, put nitrogen fertilizer onto crops as we move forward. Also, uh, carbon credits can be used to offset um, climate risk um, and price risk, et cetera, uh, within your businesses. So if you've got credit stored within your uh, ANREU account and you hit a, uh, a dry period or a year when you got hit by frost or whatever it is, uh, you can pull those out, sell them and keep your cash flow relatively even. And I think there's also evidence that as we build carbon within soils, the cost of production will also be lower. Um, also a significant number of soil health benefits. Um, as we add carbon to a soil, and I think this is particularly so for your very sandy and, and loamy soils in WA, um, that will start to increase both the cation exchange and anion exchange capacity of those soils. And this is a bit of data from New South Wales, so that if you add a 1% increase in soil organic carbon only to 10 centimetres, your soil will be holding um, and circulating uh, more than 1,000 kilograms of N, 220 kgs of P and, and heap more S. So those cation and anion exchange capacities are really important to our ability to hold and cycle those nutrients. And as in the sandy sort of soils, um, your cation exchange capacity is largely run by soil organic carbon. So as you add more soil organic carbon, the cation exchange capacity lifts. Um, also, as you add carbon to a soil, you're increasing water holding capacity. In round figures, if we added a tonne of carbon per hectare to a soil, we will be adding the ability to hold four tonnes of water, which has obviously got some production benefits. But also, there's the opportunity to make some money out of uh, soil carbon. Now, this is, the, this is some large-scale data collected uh, off grazing properties in, from central Queensland down through into northern New South Wales over the last uh, five years. So these properties were sampled in 2016. Uh, and what I want to illustrate there is that if you look at the annual EBIT from carbon, um, around the sort of 79 up to $272 a hectare range. But then look at the annual EBIT from livestock production off those properties over that same period, substantially lower. And then I also took the last year, which was the highest cattle prices on record and compared that back to the carbon income. And you'll see again, the carbon income is significantly exceeding the EBIT from livestock production. But there's a couple of figures over here I really want to point out. We're now starting to collect some data on the CO2 sequestered per kilogram of beef produced. So you'll see property B there has actually sequestered 143 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of steak and sausages sold off that property. Uh, if you look at it from a live weight basis, it's double that. Um, you've got the lowest one was 47 kilos and the next one was 138 kilograms of CO2 CO2 sequestered per kilogram of product. So I think these are, are really interesting figures. And when the market, uh, people in the markets uh, saw this yesterday, um, the price of soil carbon credits just shot up. Um, so how do we go about changing soil organic carbon? Uh, I think firstly, it comes back to managing soils and the management practices that we put on those soils. And these are the soil health principles that uh, we we run by. So firstly, to increase soil health, we're going to have to plan for it, monitor it and manage it for it to happen. It won't happen by itself. Uh, we want to maximise photosynthetic capacity and capture of sunlight. Um, we want to balance biology, plant nutrition and soil structure. No one of those by itself is actually going to drive the system forward. We want to introduce and foster biodiversity, and this is really critical. We want to optimise soil surface protection, and that is to provide food and shelter for the soil biology. And we want to incorporate livestock. There's some good evidence that incorporating livestock into a cropping system um, recycles the carbon that's in that uh, material uh, uh, much better. Um, 
But obviously in any business, whether it's a grazing business or a cropping business, we've got to make money. And so gross margin is going to be a major determinant of our profitability. Gross margin, whether it's cropping or grazing, is a function of plant productivity. And plant productivity is a function of plant available water and nutrients. Plant available water and nutrients is a function of our cation exchange capacity. And some of the cation exchange capacities in West Australian soils are quite scary, scarily low. Cation exchange capacity is a function of soil organic carbon and particularly the humic component of that soil organic carbon. Soil organic carbon creation is a function of biological activity. Biological activity is a function of the food, shelter, water and air that we provide for that biology. And food, shelter, water and air is a function of plant productivity, which is a function of plant available water and nutrients. And so around we go. And what we have is a cycle, which is in fact a part of the carbon cycle. But it's, it's even more than a carbon cycle. It actually ends up being a spiral. And as we start to focus on ecosystem health and soil health, we will start to spiral that ecosystem health upwards. And I don't think we know where the limits to that, the top of that spiral are. But if we are not uh, managing in these ways, then, then our ecos ecosystems will be spiralling down in terms of ecosystem health and soil health. So there are many, many ways to increase soil health, but the critical thing is um, it's dependent on management and the decisions that soil managers and farmers make every day as they get out of bed are going to determine whether you're sequestering carbon, whether you're improving soil health or not. The paradigm shift here, I think, is that we should be managing for biology. I think most of our conventional management systems at the moment are set up to manage for chemistry. I think we need to step back and look at what does it take to manage well for biology. We still have access to all the inputs that we need. So all the chemicals, all the fertilizers, all of those things are still part of moving an ecosystem forward. Um, but maybe we use them in a different way and in different quantities. And biodiversity is also critical to increasing the rate of carbon sequestration in a soil and also the soil health itself. So just an illustration within a grazing system, uh, there's a conventionally grazed property on the left and a cell grazed property on the right. Um, and when you look at the soils, you can see a substantial difference. And the property on the right is sequestering three tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum uh, compared to the property on the left. So if you do a quick sum on that, um, three tonnes of carbon is roughly 10 tonnes of CO2 sequestered per hectare per annum at, say, $100 a tonne for round figures. That's $1,000 a hectare gross income from carbon. And as a rule of thumb, you divide that by two to get rid of all the discounts and all the problems and costs that are in there. So that would be a net income uh, after all costs of at least $500 per hectare per annum by doing what it should be doing anyway. So I think it's um, it's a great thing to, to be doing. Um, Multi-species cover cropping is obviously one of the tools um, that are available to us. And here's an example from near Williams. Um, and on the right-hand paddock there, that uh, had a summer multi-species cover crop put into it, which pretty well failed. So it sort of germinated, a bit came up. There was uh, one sort of fairly light graze with the sheep uh, and then the barley was planted. In the left-hand paddock on the same property, that paddock was sprayed twice with glyphosate. And uh, after harvest, the paddock on the right, after what is basically a failed multi-species cover crop, had a one tonne higher yield per hectare than the paddock on the left. So just that little bit of extra biodiversity in there has significantly started to change that ecosystem and visually changed it. So why don't we get significant changes? Why isn't everybody doing this sort of stuff? And I think particularly in the cropping industries, it's to do what I call the valley of death. And 
there's a place where we're at, for example, and there might be a place where we want to be. But we perceive that at the bottom of this valley of death, there's these crocodiles that are going to consume us uh, if we misstep on the way over. And after a bit of a survey some, of some people in West Australia recently, these are some of the outcomes that were given to me as issues at the moment, as weed control issues, disease issues, pest issues, low pH, and I don't think I've heard of lower pHs than in West Australia, soil compaction, mineral tie-up, um, etc. But the inputs are yield focus, you know, minimum till, which we need going forward, chemical fallow, granular N, P and K, et cetera, and in some cases, stubble burning. And when I ask the question, do you think that some of those inputs and those focuses are actually responsible for some of the outcomes? Um, it's fairly obvious that they are. And it's maybe where we want to be as a farmer is if we could do weed control as needed. And in a cropping system, you're probably not going to get away from weed control. But we can certainly reduce, and there's lots of evidence of, of pests and diseases being eliminated when the BRICS level of your crops come up, which is a function of soil health. We can get soils back to much higher pHs than where they are at the moment. We can add carbon to soils, we can increase infiltration, infiltration and get higher nutrient density in our products, etc., and make our minerals more available. But I think there's a perception that there's a tightrope that goes across this valley of death. And you've got to walk this tightrope. And if you make one misstep, down you go, and the crocodiles are going to get you. And when I analyze this, it comes down to fear. And I, I believe there are three fears that are preventing people moving to a place where, where there's not too many people wouldn't want to be. And it's fear. But to, and I think the biggest fear is actually fear of what peers are going to say. If you step out of the norm in a district, um, you're going to try and everyone will try and pull you back. And that's, that's certainly very, very real. There's fear of change, which is normal for all of us. And there's a fear of going broke, which is also a fear pretty normal for all of us. So how do we get across this valley of death? Well, if we don't want to walk on a tightrope, it seems to me that what we need to do is build a bridge to get from one side to the other. But in order to build a bridge, we firstly have to build the foundations or the support for that bridge. Otherwise, the bridge will also collapse. And I look at those supports as firstly, changing our focus from a profit, from a, from a yield focus to a profit focus. And they are actually two different things. Um, maintaining our, our minimum till and the machinery and the technologies we've got is important. Uh, looking at cover crops, particularly multi-species cover crops, um, maybe shifting to liquid and foliar plant nutrition as opposed to putting it on the soil. A big emphasis on calcium and trace mineral nutrition will help us get there. Um, also, there's plenty of evidence now that variety selection is important. Um, stubble retention, um, composting, et cetera, um, and adding biology into the system and supporting that biology are the things that are going to help build the foundations um, for that bridge. Um, some of the things we might need to do is do less harm, for example. And, and when I say that, I mean do less harm to biology. Uh, we can do less harm with using glyphosate, for example, by adding fulvic acid to it and reducing the rates. We can use substantially less nitrogen by putting it on as a foliar application along with a with a carbon source, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of things that we can do to start building these supports. And it's a journey to get a to build these supports and build the bridge, not it's an, not an overnight shift. And what will happen is that these outcomes will accrue slowly. You know, your weed control will will uh, lower, but it'll still be there. There will certainly be reduced pest and disease pressure. Our, our pHs will, will come up quickly and pH will be moved by biology rather than by chemistry. Uh, we can get higher nutrient density in our food. And the, when you think of it, the purpose of agriculture is food production and we need to be producing better quality food. Our soils will get softer. We'll have less risk in our businesses um, and we will have the potential for carbon trading. Uh, so I think that uh, that's essentially the way I see it. Um, and we are managing an ecosystem 
and carbon is the centre of that ecosystem, and I look at it as a pie. And as we focus on the increasing the size of this pie, uh, we'll be increasing energy flow, which is sunlight energy use, improving the water cycle, improving our soil health and improving biodiversity. When we do that, we create more abundance. And uh, I'll pull up there and uh, open it up for questions. So I think we'll have some roving mics. Terry, thank you. There was, you may not have heard it, but at various points through your talk, there were murmurs through the room. So I think what you were saying was resonating with a lot of people. So do we have some questions for Terry, Minister? Terry, can I just say that is like the most fantastic presentation. Like, I guess we've all heard most of these things. I've never uh, seen it pulled together uh, so succinctly. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. Just a very uh, specific question. Um, we had earlier on raised in our uh, discussion uh, a concern that we probably didn't have uh, enough agronomists here in Western Australia that really um, uh, understood the uh, this full biological system and, and what we need to do to implement this. So we're sort of trying to think, and I don't know if you can give us some advice about how, how could we uh, in some way assist uh, to get um, a stronger cohort of uh, uh, agronomists uh, trained uh, to really understand this complexity of, uh, of this biologically focused farming? Thanks, Minister. And I think that is a... Uh that's the $64 million question, in fact, because I think in the cropping industries, the biggest impediment uh, to regenerative agriculture is, in fact, the current agronomic paradigms. Um, and there isn't a good training process in place. Uh, we've got um, Southern Cross University, uh, New South Wales, who this year will be graduating their first um, regen ag degree. Um, but it, it's probably that's a drop in the ocean compared to what we need. And, and maybe if we if there was even a graduate certificate developed uh, in Regen Ag, uh, which I think actually um, Southern Cross University has, but there's nothing specific to carbon. Uh, and it's there's very little uh, in the literature around carbon and regenerative agriculture. So it is a it's a difficult space in which to get people trained because the the knowledge is growing and changing at a tremendous rate. Um, but it certainly is something that needs addressing. Other questions? So have we got a roving mic? Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm a farmer and um, we've been growing carbon for quite a few years and we're just starting a registration at the moment to go on a, a program. Um, but one thing that concerns me is the future taxes on like methane, on livestock or um, other things that we think we might implement. Um, and I, I noticed you talked about the benefits to production. And um, I just, I think that is where uh, we all have to look at more than anything that the incentive is to um, have a, a benefit to production rather than uh, looking at carbon as being a income tool. Um, yeah, I would totally agree with that. In fact, my focus uh, everywhere I go is to say that you should have a production and profitability focus first. You should be doing regen ag for those benefits and look at carbon as being an opportunity or a secondary source of income that comes out of that. Um, I don't think that you're going to be doing it well enough um, if you're doing it for the carbon income. I think you should be doing it for the carbon for the sake of production and the health of an ecosystem. Um, and the fact that you can get paid for that to, to me is a bonus uh, and a very, very good bonus, uh, but it should not be the primary focus. David. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. That was just fantastic. Um, I, I, I was on a, on a, on a webinar um, last year and 
uh, it was an academic from New South Wales University, I think, and I asked her the question, what impact does our current rate of herbicide um, and synthetic fertilizers have on soil biology and the ability to build soil biology? Um, her response was nothing. Um, what's your response to that question? Yeah, I, I think that firstly, we've got to start off by saying that not all inputs are bad. And in fact, some fertilizer inputs are critical for the health of soil biology. So we've got to balance the, the discussion rather than say one's bad and one's good, etc. But in terms of damage, I think there's some CSIRO data suggesting that um, some of the salt-based phosphorus fertilizers, for example, will damage between 30 and 70% of the mycorrhizal fungal population, which is the organism that was going to feed the plant with phosphorus in the first place. Um, certainly uh, overuse of nitrogen, I think, uh, will damage biology um, and damage plants as well. And I think overuse of, nit of nitrogen is actually the thing that is leading to um, the attraction uh, of diseases and pests to those plants. Um, and I could go into a very long winded description of why that is, but I won't, I won't do that now. Um, they're probably the two um, that I would uh, pick on, and, and they're both ones that can change. I also think that the current paradigm is actually based on measuring soils and applying fertilisers to soils, um, which when you start to look at the science of rhizophagy um, is probably completely damaging to the plant, soil um, and biological relationship. So I think we need to sort of start to think about things in terms of, of uh, how rhizophagy works. Um, and um, yeah, I'll probably leave it at that. Got two. Oh, wherever the mic goes. <laughs> then you think. Hey, Terry, Blythe here. Great presentation. Um, what would be your key points of advice for producers looking to register a soil carbon or carbon project in general? I think uh, number one um, drafting gate for me is uh, are you prepared to do the practice change and do it for the next 25 to 30 years to where it is um, a part of what you do? Um, that's the first drafting gate. And if if you're not prepared to either change grazing management systems to allow that to happen or change your cropping and particularly the nutrition programs, um, then uh, don't start. Um, that's, that to me is probably the, that's the first and, and key drafting gate. And then second is d develop the knowledge um, particularly around how our soil plant and, um, and biological systems operate. Um, and one thing as well would be shifting from um, taking soil analysis to taking sap analysis. So instead of uh, figuring out what the soil needs, go to the plant and work out what the plant needs. And then through foliar applications, you can meet those uh, with a timely application. So uh, those are they're probably, the, they're probably the key ones. I would yeah. like to just, uh, so there's something I'd, I'd like to come back to, and that was the issue around um, uh, taxes and, uh, and, and crediting um, and, and this issue around carbon neutral. The whole world, including Australia, is heading towards net zero. And net zero and carbon neutral are two different things. And if you are doing something like a soil carbon project, you will be at net zero. And the numbers that I put up there before about uh, CO2 removed uh, per kilogram of beef, for example, is after accounting for methane and after accounting for all emissions on those properties. And so those properties, after accounting for everything, um, still have 400,000 tonnes of CO2 to sell after four years, including two years of drought, um, four years of pasture dieback, uh, one guy was completely burnt out in the 2019 bushfires and one's had two floods. So 
those properties I've put up have been through the normal mill of things that happen to agriculture. Terry, I'll just butt in before. You talked about earlier in your talk about the impacts of drought. Can you expand on that a little bit? I can. So in the projects that uh, where I put the data up, um, we experienced the 18 and 19 drought, which were, you know, two of the worst droughts on the East Coast um, in history. Uh, you've got to go back 100 years to find something as bad. What we have found is that on heavy clay soils, we have lost carbon in the top 30 centimetres of those soils. Now, I can't, I don't, have the data analysed to the extent yet whether I can say whether that was lost out of the top 15 centimetres or the top 17 centimetres or the top 20. But down to 30, um, on the heavy cracking clay soils, we lost carbon over that five-year period. Below 30 centimetres in exactly the same spots, the carbon had increased. What we found, which quite to our surprise, was that the lighter soils um, actually sequestered much more carbon than, than the better soils, which was the reverse of what we expected. Um, and so the reason I think that, that well over 50% of the credits will be issued from below 30 centimetres is that we went through that very dry period. And so I think if we could uh, go through you know, more of a normal run of seasons, a higher percentage of those credits will actually come from the, the top 30 centimetres. So carbon, I, I sort of really think that your carbon's going to cycle, especially out of the top 10 centimetres. So the top 10 or 15 centimetre measurement to me is absolutely meaningless. Um, and I sort of tend to think that the top 15 to 20 centimetres is probably where most of it's cycling. And there is data showing that at 20 centimetres, carbon has been shown to be stable for 1,000 to 2,000 years. And as you get down to a metre and a half and two metres, it's stable for 10,000 to 13,000 years. So um, I think that uh, we are, the, the, the fear around drought um, for me has dissipated with the, the data that we have on scale. And that's across about an 18,000 hectare scale. Thanks, Terry. Um, question here and then one here. Uh, Terry, thanks very much for that presentation. I sincerely hope that it will be available online afterwards because we're go I'm going to have to watch it three or four times to take it all in. Uh, my specific question is, you mentioned SAP analysis. John Kempf, is, in his webinars, has emphasised that, but my understanding is that there is no laboratory in Australia doing it. Is there a laboratory? And if not... Uh, what's the procedure to go from tissue analysis to SAP analysis? Because tissue analysis tells you what happened a fortnight ago. SAP analysis tells you what's happening today. Yeah, there is a laboratory uh, and it's in Tasmania. And I think there's a second one uh, now in New South Wales as well. Um, so there are, um, you, you'll just have to search them out. Um, I can put this... Uh, thing back up on the screen and there's a um, we call it QR code there. If you click on that, it will not only give you this presentation, but it will give you a much larger one. Um, and I'll just put that back up again, I think. Um, there you go. So that QR code there, if you put your phone on that, um, that will lead you and give you a download of a presentation that is actually went for four hours. Um, what I've given you here is a 20 minute slice out of what normally takes about four hours. So that will, uh, that'll give you the full, the full one. Thanks, Terry. You've got just about every table with their phone in the air at the moment. <laughs> Jason. Thank you, Terry. I just had a quick question about the, the, the data that you put up about the um, the economics what what type of rainfall were those farms at for those for that data they were in um, 600 650 mil rainfall areas uh, but through that period they'd averaged about 550 due to the dry years in the middle uh, and they'd been down in the 300s um, for one to two years out of that period. 
Right. One last question before we wind up for lunch. Table at the back here. Uh, yes, uh, Michael Shaw. Uh, I uh, farm at um, Tamman and Calabaran. And uh, each year I'd probably burn about 8,000 tonnes of uh, stubble residue. And my interest is the idea that we take that stubble and pyrolyse it and probably get about 37% or so of uh, biochar from it and incorporate that biochar back into the soils uh, as a really a permanent store of the carbon cycle and uh, just whether that's, um, uh, you know, a prospect for a, a project in the future carbon area, because I guess I'd like to see potentially a change just like minimum tillage changed over the, the farming practices that could get to the point where if that was a successful concept, it might just be a standard practice that crop residues are taken out of that short-term carbon cycle and put into the longer-term carbon storage process. Yeah. So my understanding at the moment is that uh, biochar produced on farm and cycled back into soils on farm um, can be part of a project. Uh, it's I don't think it can be imported, um, but you would need to check the methodology on that. Um, the the downside to doing that though is that you're going to uncover your soils and. You know, one of those soil health principles is actually maintaining ground cover. And the purpose of that is not so much to um, get that back into the soil, but it's to protect the biology and everything that's going on in the soil and, and particularly to reduce the temperatures. Um, so I'd say that you want to be pretty careful um, of not losing you know, the benefits uh, of that stubble. Uh, and the other option for that stubble, which I think is another way of um, cycling it back into the system in a much better way, is actually put it through animals. Um, you've, got, you've got lignin and cellulose there that needs to be broken down um, and left as it is on the paddock. That's very hard for biology to do because not enough nitrogen in the system to do that. But if you put that through a ruminant, um, it goes back at around about, you know, 80, 85% of what a ruminant eats will go back onto and in the soil in the forms of dung and urine. And particularly then if you've got um, dung beetles that will bury that dung, uh, then you're actually putting that carbon back in uh, in another way. And you have control doing that by, uh, you know, to pull those animals off before they remove all the stubble so that you can still maintain your ground cover under that system. Terry, can I just like be very naughty and intervene here? I know Cess is going to wind us up, but can we get you over here in person in WA before the end of the year? We would love uh, to have an opportunity for so many more people uh, to hear what you have to say and uh, really engage us in, in conversation. So can we put you on the spot and say, ah, can you come over to WA? Our borders are open. <laughs> uh, I am actually going to be in Perth uh, and WA in the first week in November. Um, and I had actually requested a meeting with you somewhere along the line. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> so I will gratefully accept uh, uh, the invitation. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, and, and I, yeah, I will be there that first week. Excellent response. Thank you, Terry. So can you please all give a very big hand to Terry? Thank you. Thank you very much.